As I said, today's lesson is going to be a, a positive lesson. We're in John chapter 10. I love the book of John. And uh, so while you're turning to John chapter 10, we're also going to uh, ask our trivia questions. Uh, who, by the way, who's on time reading your Bible through this week at least, this past week? Uh, okay. Daniel's holding his head in shame. That's, there are a couple of us. All right, so uh, now if you're not getting the email, please let me know. Uh, get me your email address. I'll be happy to uh, get you on the list. So you can also get your copy with the prescribed reading for the week. And in that reading uh, is where I, I find the trivia questions. This week's trivia questions are the first one. What did the Lord instruct Job to do about his friends? This is near the end of the book. After they've all had their say, and then God gives Job a series of, I think, 67 questions that he can't answer. Uh, and then he turns his attention to his friends, and he instructs Job to do something. Probably it was. Oh, was it? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Diane. It was to pray for them, okay? Uh, and then uh, uh, Job uh, has a new family after that, uh, uh, more children and so forth. But what act of Job's preceded his growth of his family and his wealth again? His obedience, he prayed for those folks. Not only did God tell him to do it, he did it. Uh, you know, sometimes we hear from God that we know we need to do something. Doing it sometimes is, is something else. But in the New Testament, when Paul first came to Ephesus, he found a small group of believers there. How many were in the group? Twelve. Yes, uh, it was a small church at, there at Ephesus. Now let's turn our attention to the lesson, which is uh, found in John chapter 10. Uh, uh, a little background here before we, we get into reading the, uh, the, the scripture is that in, in chapter 8, uh, you'll remember that Jesus is, is teaching and they bring a woman caught in the act of adultery and he uh, uh, does not condemn her and tells her to go and sin no more. Uh, and then he's, he's also uh, confronted by the Pharisees and he makes one of his, uh, his uh, I am statements. Uh, he, he was talking about uh, how God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And then he said, before Abraham was... I am, yeah. So he's saying, I am is here. Remember Moses at the burning bush? Tell them, I am has sent you, okay? And so he's declaring unequivocally that he is the God of the universe and he is the Messiah. And they tried to stone him for it. That's chapter eight. Chapter nine, we studied a couple of weeks ago where he encounters the man who was born blind. Remember that one? And then he heals him on the Sabbath, and uh, the Pharisees uh, uh, responded by kicking the guy out of the, out of the temple, uh, excommunicating him, and then plotting to kill Jesus. Now here in chapter 10 is a continuation of that. It's the same day. It's the same place. It's the same crowd that he's just been dealing with with these other uh, uh, events. And let's, the, the text begins in verse 7, but I want to read the first six verses as well of John chapter 10, where it says, uh, and this is Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say to you, in other words, this is important, this is new information, Pay attention. Uh, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. 
Uh, he's just been uh, exposing the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees, and now he begins to illustrate that. Uh, now, remember that this crowd that he's in is uh, uh, it's an agrarian society. Everybody lives, uh, or most of the people live, tied to the land. And the shepherds were everywhere around the city and, and in the north and in the south. And, and, and by the way, if you've been there to Israel, it's a very dry and arid place today. But in this context, it was still a lush green uh, uh, paradise because there are uh, uh, lions and bears and, and all kind of uh, 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 green uh, meadows and so forth. Uh, so there was plenty of grass for the sheep to feed on. And there were sheep everywhere. So there were shepherds everywhere. And he's talking about the sheepfold. He said, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Uh, every village had a sheepfold. It was an enclosure made of rocks or logs uh, where uh, when the shepherds came from the field, uh, after being there for days, they would bring the sheep in to get some rest uh, for themselves and, and, and have a safe place for the sheep. The, the sheepfold had one opening. It didn't have a door. It had an opening. And uh, there was a, a shepherd that typically at night would sleep laying across that opening. And that, uh, Jesus is using that imagery when he says, he uses the term the door. Um, and, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. In other words, the shepherd's not going to climb over the fence uh, for spurious purposes. He's going to come through the door. Uh, verse 3, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Um, C.W., uh, by the way, if you've read his book, he tells this story in the book about how he was with a shepherd family down in Mexico and and the son uh, would always go to the to the uh, uh, enclosure and and lead the sheep out and uh, 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 so that they could go out and, and eat grass and drink water and so forth and and CW volunteered to go and do that for him one morning uh, and he went out there and opened the door and tried to call the sheep out, but they wouldn't come. And then he goes into the enclosure and tries to shoo them out, and all he did was create a great deal of confusion and activity by the sheep because they weren't leaving. They were afraid of him because he wasn't the shepherd. So the son came out and called the sheep, and they heard his voice. They knew him. And they just came right on out. Uh, so that was, and that's the context of this, this story that Jesus is telling. Verse 4, uh, he, he talks about the shepherd and he, he putteth forth his own sheep and he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice and a stranger they will not follow but will flee from him. Uh, for they know not the voice of strangers. Listen, church, a lot of voices screaming for your attention. A lot of voices saying, I am wisdom, listen to me. A lot of voices saying, I know the way to the kingdom, listen to me. But if you know Jesus, and you're intimate with him. You know his voice. And you know error when you hear it. If you study his word, you know error. And there's a lot of error out there, okay? But we have the God of the universe, the Holy Spirit within us, that is going to send up those red flags when that stuff starts coming at us. So their voice we will not hear. Uh, 
All right, so uh, verse 6, this parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. So the crowd is not quite getting it yet. So Jesus is going to go further in his explanation of what he means here to make it crystal clear. All right, so uh, uh, we're, we're going to pick up where the lesson does with verse 7. So uh, in chapter 10, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Uh, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says several times, I am in the book of uh, John. Uh, he said, uh, before Abraham was, I am. Then he says uh, a little later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And now he's trying to make it very clear to these people uh, in a context that they understand he says, I am the door of the sheep. I am. And here he's beginning to talk about salvation. He's beginning to talk about come unto me and I'll give you rest. Let's begin to think of ourselves as sheeple. Okay? <laughs> All right? Now, that's not a compliment by any stretch of the imagination. But... We are the sheep of his pasture. Now, shepherds down through the, the history of the world have been important to uh, the economy, to, to the well-being of communities for, uh, uh, for food, for uh, clothing, and uh, fabric. So uh, let's think about some of the famous... Uh, shepherds that we know about. Remember, Abraham was a shepherd. Uh, Isaac, Jacob were all shepherds. Uh, David was a shepherd. And who was the greatest shepherd of all? Jesus. Jesus. Huh? Jesus. Jesus. Well, let's go back a little further than that. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I will not lack any good thing. I shall not want. Okay? The great shepherd. God is our shepherd. And Jesus is saying, I am that shepherd. Okay? Um, so, he says, truly, truly, or, or uh, uh, verily, verily, uh, pay attention. This is important. I am the door. Now, Jesus is saying, I'm the one that allows access to rest and safety. I'm the one that stands between you and danger. I'm the one that stands between you and the thief, the robber, the murderer. I'm the one that stands between you and every evil thing that might come at you. By the way, you know, that nothing comes into your life except it comes through the filter of God's permissive will. Amen. Okay? You know that. God is sovereign. He is in control. And sometimes we forget that. <clears throat> but he is reminding us here that uh, uh, first he says, I am the door. Of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees here. They're thieves, they're robbers. And, and you'll see him uh, deal with them a little later when he comes into 
the, uh, the city on Palm Sunday. He goes into the temple. He look, looks around. He sees all of this merchandising, the thievery, the money changers, stealing. And then the next day he comes in and drives them all out. Thieves, robbers. Um, uh, he said, all those who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. There was something about the way they taught the way they live their lives that did not ring true. You've heard some of these folks. Uh, when, when I was uh, uh, working for Wholesome Bread in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, I would go to work at like 3 or 4 in the morning. And at that time, I was listening to the radio, and, and there were all kinds of, of preachers on, on the radio at that time of the morning, if you listened for them. Uh, uh, J. Basil Mull, Mrs. Mull, you remember them? And, uh, and then there was Reverend Ike. You remember Re Reverend Ike? Okay, Reverend Ike says, you know, the Bible says that... Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, but I say that the lack of money is the root of all evil. You know, there's, there's some crazy stuff out there. But that's just one of the examples of voices that don't ring true. When you've got the, the God of the universe living in you, you know there's something that just doesn't sound right about some of the things that you're going to hear from folks that claim to be preachers of the gospel. And there are those that want to fleece the sheep. That's their purpose. Uh, you plant your seed, you, God will bless you. You know, you, you send me money, okay? And God will bless you. Uh, so they fleece the sheep. And, and then, verse 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Now, he doesn't say it yet. He waits until verse 11 to tell us that he is the good shepherd. But there are thieves out there. There are thieves in sheep's clothing. There are wolves out there uh, ready to devour. Now, let's look at the second section uh and and frankly there's way too much material to cover today uh, i mean we could we could really drill down on some of these theological terms and 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 just hang out here forever and i wish we had the time but we don't uh so we're going to move on to the second section which is verses uh 11 through 13 uh jesus again says i am so this is a continuing theme. He's trying to get their attention and let them know he's the Messiah. He's the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, he says. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So, so what's the behavior of the good shepherd? By the way, this is a, 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 an answer that fills the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 34 where he predicts the good shepherd uh, is going to come and rescue his people. So Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and here he foretells what's going to happen. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. How did he do that? Going to the cross. He went to the cross. The good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Now, that's something that ought to get our attention. We're sheep. We really are. And, and, and if we accept that, and accept the fact that we're not smart enough to be saved. We're not smart enough to figure out how to stay saved. 
that we're not uh, 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 endowed with enough wisdom to know how to get from uh, death to life, from this life to the next. We have to trust our shepherd, don't we? <clears throat> we have to trust our shepherd because we don't know the way, but he does. Now think about this. Jesus said he leads his sheep. In, in this context, the shepherd leads the sheep. The shepherd is not a cattle driver, okay? Uh, cattle are driven. Sheep are led. Uh, he walks before the sheep. He finds the best path. He finds the best food. He finds the best uh, uh, still waters. He finds safety for us. He leads us, okay? We can trust our shepherd to lead us correctly. Do we? Do we? I didn't hear it this time. We should. We should. All right. So let's, let's agree that we should trust him to lead us. Um, so the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, he's not a hired hand. He's not the hired gun. Okay? He is the son. He is... Uh, a part of the family that oversees the sheep. He loves the sheep. Now, when the sheep would be led into the fold, the shepherd would take his rod and he would stop every sheep. And he would inspect every sheep every time they went into the sheepfold. He would look him over for any injuries or parasites or any lanolin uh, that had plugged up pores. It was a nasty business. But the shepherd inspected every sheep every time they went into the sheepfold with the rod. Remember the rod? The Lord is my shepherd. His rod and his staff comfort me. There was a part of that work with the rod that was a comfort for the sheep because they were inspected. They, uh, uh, they were taken care of. The shepherd knew those sheep because every day he would inspect every one. Jesus is intimately aware of your circumstances. He knows every wound that you have. He knows every care that you're uh, burdened with. He knows every need before you ask. He knows you intimately. All right? He's not a hired hand, and he's not going to run away when you face trouble. So he's going to be there for you. Now let's wrap it up with uh, point number three. Oh, we got to fill in on two? We do. Uh, an essential doctrine that, uh, by the way, there are those that, that say that Jesus was a great storyteller and, and, and we don't need to really concern ourselves with so much doctrine. But his stories are so pregnant with the doctrine of uh, the eternal God that we need to pay attention the, the depth of what he is trying to convey to us here is so unfathomable. Now, here, it, it's also, it's, it's, someone once said that the theology of the Bible is, is uh, so safe that even a child can splash around in the shallows. But the depths are unfathomable uh, once you try to to sound it out and find what it all means. I don't think we'll ever know what it all means until we get to heaven. And I think heaven's going to be an eternal learning experience. Uh, I think it is. It's, it's going to be glorious. But here, we're going to talk about an essential doctrine here, uh, and it is uh, uh, Christ as the uh, substitute propitiation. 
because of God's righteousness and holiness, that's the fill-in, uh, humanity's sin must be atoned for in order for people to be reconciled, which is the second word, to God. As the propitiation for sins, Christ's death is the appeasement or satisfaction of God's wrath against sin. Christ's propitiation for our sins demonstrates both God's great love towards sinners as well as the necess necessary payment that results from the penalty of sin. So holiness, reconciled, wrath, and love are your fill-ins there. Now, uh, let's talk about the, the, uh, uh, the good shepherd who knows his sheep. Uh, so we, we've seen, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, and here he repeats, <clears throat> I am, verses 14 through 18, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have no other sheep, that, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. I am the good shepherd, he says. Again, I am. It's not lost on this crowd. Not at all. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd was prophesied throughout the Bible in Zechariah and the Psalms and in uh, Ezekiel. The good shepherd was the Messiah. The Messiah is coming, and everybody had their uh, eyes looking for that Messiah. Well, not everybody. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees certainly didn't. Um, Jesus said, I know my own, and my own know me. Let's break that down. I know my own. Do you belong to Jesus today? Amen. If you do, he knows you. You're not just a number. You're not just one in the crowd. You're not just one of the nine billion people living on the planet. He knows you. You. He intercedes for you. Your name, my name, on the lips of Jesus as he's talking to the Father. Oh, what a thought that the God of the universe cares about me, about you, and he knows you intimately, better than you know yourself. He knows every hurt, every habit. Every hang-up. I know my own. Man, we could spend a week right there. I know my own. And my own know me. Now think about that one for a second. How well do you know him? Oh my. How well do we know him? Do you know what the Bible says about him? Are you intimate with his words, his thoughts, as he's given them to us in, in his word? I know my own and my own know me. Do you hear him when he speaks? One of my prayers that I pray every morning. Oh God, help me learn how to listen to you so that I can hear what you're saying to me. And then help me obey what you've said to me. Uh, because I know I miss it too often. What he speaks into my spirit. Um, so Jesus is saying that he wants us to have the same kind of relationship with him. Listen to this, verse 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. 
Oh, wow. He wants us to have that same relationship with Him that He has with the Father. Did He have a very tight, intimate relationship with the Father? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That kind of relationship with Him and He with us as Jesus has with the Father. <clears throat> the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Woo, what a thought. Now, he says, I'm going to do something. And I'm going to do something for you. What's he say he's going to do? Lay down his life. I Lay down my life for the sheep. Don't ever think for a moment that the Jews took his life. Don't ever think for a moment that the Romans took his life. Not even for an instant. He willingly gave his life. For us. He willingly submitted to God the Father pouring out the wrath on him for our sins. What we deserved. He took it. He willingly laid down his life for the sheep. For us. And he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Now, my mother was convinced that those were people on another planet. <laughs> but I think it's more rational to think that he's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about us. Okay? The crowd. Remember the crowd. He's in Jerusalem. He's surrounded by Jews. And he's telling them, I have others. I have others um, that uh, are not of this fold, and I must bring them also. He said, he didn't say I might. He didn't say I'm just thinking about it. He said I must bring them. His intention toward you being saved has always been the same. Since before the earth was founded, you were in his heart. I was in his heart. And he knew that he must bring them also. And he says, they will listen to my voice. Are you listening? Jesus said, they will listen to my voice. Maybe that's a prayer you need to pray too. God help me. Listen. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock. There won't be Jews and Gentiles. There will be the bride of Christ. Amen. Just one family. One church. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. He had the will, the power, and the authority to do this. Now, he's laying down his life and he says clearly, verse 18, no one takes it from me. When you see me crucified, Understand, nobody is taking my life from me. I'm laying it down willingly. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. Aren't you glad? <laughs> All right. Uh, this charge I have received from my Father. As we... As, as we think about this this week, I want you to consider 
what he just told us here, that he wants to have a relationship with us that is as close and intimate as the relationship he has with the Father. And that was the point or the purpose of him laying down his life, dying on the cross, paying for all of our sins so that we could have the kind of relationship he has with the Father. What a thought. What a thought. Uh, we also have a fill-in on uh, page 87 of your student guide where it says uh, the people of God uh, compromised both are comprised of both Jew and Gentile. The church is created by God through the atoning death of Christ. As the people of God, the church seeks to live under God's ruling care, ruling care, while we are protected and cared for by Him. So, church, death, and ruling are the fill-ins. Uh, now, take this with you when you go, these thoughts, and ponder them this week and see if you don't hear a little more from God this week. Let's pray. Father, we, we are grateful that Jesus is our good shepherd, that he is the door, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the God of the living. Oh, thank you, Father, for shepherding these unruly and rebellious sheep. Now we pray that you would help us to grow in our relationship with you, that we might experience a little bit of what it's like to have the relationship that you have with the Father. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.